This is Roger Lesser, October 5th, 2012. Um, Roger, um, where were you raised and, and when did you move to Washington, D.C.? I was born in New York City in Queens, in Rigo Park, Queens, in June of 1943. It was like a middle and lower middle class, primarily Jewish neighborhood, and my parents had moved there in 1940. There was still like not when I was born, but when my sister was born three years previously. There was still lots of farmlands around there, but we lived in like a five-story, six-story apartment house in a one-bedroom apartment with the four of us. I still don't quite understand where we all slept in there, but um, in some ways I lived, you know, a very regular childhood and in some ways not because my parents were both political activists, and my father was a union organizer for the Furniture Workers Union in New Jersey, and before that he was a shop steward in the United Electrical Workers mm -hmm. in New York, which was like a left-wing union, and they were both, I don't know if I want to talk much about their specific politics. Yeah. But well, I was going to ask next, what early experiences do you think mm -hmm. attuned you to social justice? That would Well, I had parents who were, you know, very socially conscious and were always actively involved in politics. My mother was a secretary for a guy, I can't remember his name right now, it's escaping me, but he was the first black merchant marine captain in the United States, uh, merchant marine, and he took supplies to the Russians through the lines to, you know, it was a very brave thing to do. And it's strange to me that, you know, I've never really heard much about him since that time because, you know, it seems so notable. There were so few black people in that kind of position. She was like his secretary. It was a couple of blocks up the street from where we lived, and the American Labor Party was a party run by Henry Wallace, who had been vice president, and uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And my father was, you know, busy taking people out on strike. He was still producing furniture in New Jersey. <laughs> Seems hard to imagine now, but and in the early 50s, I mean, I don't really remember the day to day stuff, except that I remember that I always wanted to fit in because he was kind of secretive about, you know, the specific things that my parents were involved in. And I remember, I mean, my mother told me later in life that I used to tell her that I wanted to live like other kids. So I got involved in like little league baseball and stuff. And I had my two best friends were not from political families at all. I did a lot of sports things. Mm -hmm. and. Somehow in my mind, that was like taking me away from my parents' politics. So later in life, it seemed a little odd to me that I got involved myself when it, you know I found it kind of difficult to know because the FBI used to come to my parents' house and sometimes we weren't they weren't home and I had to answer their questions and or just say you know we didn't know where my parents were and stuff. I mean they were never high up in any political organization. But we did at one point hide out some guy in our house in our apartment who had been indicted under the Smith Act. And I know even less where he slept, given that the four of us didn't even, you know, fit into our apartments. Uh, but he stayed with us for a few months, which, you know, was a very brave thing for my parents to do, because if they had been discovered, it probably was a felony. So. And, uh, when I was a little older, I, I guess it was about nine, when Julius and Ethel Rosenberg were uh, executed, and my mother and I and my sister took the train to Washington to pick it in front of the White House to ask that their lives be saved. And on, I think it was the night before my ninth birthday, I remember standing in the kitchen of our apartment when word came over the radio that they had been executed. And, you know, I knew that they had two young sons and I read books that they had read, written to each other, you know, letters when they were both in jail. And 
you know, saw the pictures of their children. And then, you know, the irony of life, both the, the children ended up being at Wisconsin when I was at the University of Wisconsin, Norm and I and them, but I, I never really knew them. So it was just strange how much that sort of had, you know, continuation in life. And I also, when I was uh, nine years old, Norma's parents had a house at, outside a place called Camp Medvale. It was in northern New Jersey. My, mm -hmm. my father-in-law, or then Norma's father, had bought a Quonset hut from World War II surplus and had put it up outside of this camp that was, you know, like a very progressive camp. It was the, one of the few places that I was aware of where there were lots of black and white people mm -hmm. sort of relating to each other, you know, romantically, and there was lots of uh, theatrical events and musicals and singing. And Norma said she remembers, you can ask her when she talks to you about the Ku Klux Klan coming to the camp in New Jersey and burning uh, a swastika on the flagpole in the early 50s. So, so it was a place that was very threatening to people and and I, when I first met Norma, you know, who I've now been married to for 47 years, you know, I, again, I said she was nine years, I was nine years old, she was six, but we sort of, you know, quickly, even sounds ridiculous, but we quickly were emotionally involved with each other at that age. And, you know, it was really strange. And I, I knew Norma because Norma's mother was my father's secretary at uh, Furniture Workers Union, so our families know each other. But, I mean, you know, essentially she's been my only girlfriend, you know, my whole life. So, through all those years before college and then when we got married in, uh, whatever that is, 47 years ago, September 12th, 47 years ago, we just started. 47th wedding anniversary when we went away for the last three weeks. So. Um, you talked about going to, you grew up in New York and then you went to college at University of Wisconsin. What was that like and how, how did you get involved in political things there? Yeah, I, not wildly. It was sort of the beginning of the civil rights movement and, you know, I'd go to meetings of the Socialist Club and other kinds of civil rights organizations, but I never was tried to be a leader of anything. I mean, I went on demonstrations. At one point, Andy Goodman, who was killed in Philadelphia, Mississippi, was there at the same time, and he and I once took a 17-hour bus trip to New York uh, from Wisconsin. So, you know, I never had the kind of courage in some ways I felt bad about that, but I was happy that I'm still alive. But Andy Goodman you know, was one huh? of the three civil rights workers killed in 1964 in Mississippi. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. And the sheriff was involved in helping to kill them. And actually, he was—he grew up on the west side of New York. There's a street, because eventually my parents moved to the Upper West Side when they started making more money, and there's a street around there named for him. So. You know, I basically studied and hung out and went to some meetings and then Norma showed up when I was a senior in college there and I started going out with her again. And things were relatively quiet during that period at the university. I, mean, I graduated in June of 1964 and after a year Norma and I commuted. I went to the University of Chicago to social work school to study community, being a community organizer. And Norma went to Roosevelt University for a year. It's like a city college because we didn't want to commute. And, uh, so she did a year there and then we went back to Madison and she finished her degree. And things had gotten much more heated up in Madison. Than, I mean, it was in the demonstration against Dow Chemical, which was a you know, well-known thing in those days. Uh, people were sitting in the Commerce Building where Dow Chemical was recruiting 
people to go work for them and the police came in and beat a lot of people up. I mean, it looked a lot worse than it was and, you know, me and my friends, Norma was already, had a regular job, but, you know, there was, and then a lot of us at the university went on strike. I don't remember how long it lasted in protest and all these cops had come in looking like, you know, the cops from France with those plastic shields over their faces and their clubs and I remember the sociology department was right across the street. I was studying that. I went back for more graduate school, partly to stay out of the army and not to go to Vietnam, but it was, you know, I think it was the first time that police had come on a white university campus and beaten people up. I think it was weeks after Jackson State where something had happened. I don't even it remember. It was 1968 what, Yeah. So, and, you know, weeks after something had happened at Berkeley. So after that, things got a lot more heavy, although we left Madison to join Vista in maybe February of 1968. And we lived in the South Bronx with a Cuban family. The guy had been uh, in the Navy under Batista. And they were very nice people. They took the grandmother out of her room and put Norma in, in, and I in the room. And our job was to organize people who were on welfare and mm -hmm. go around and help organize sit-ins among welfare people to sit in the welfare office to try to raise their benefits. Mm -hmm. And Norma particularly was, it was not our cup of tea. Our yeah, we both, it sounds like we both, both you graduated in 63 from Forest Hills? Six, uh, I graduated in 60. Oh, right, right, right. We both graduated in 60. Yeah. So we both went there with Paul Simon. Right. And did you know Paul Simon? He's I kinda... remember them playing in the auditorium, Tom and Jerry, as they were called then, but I didn't really know them. And there were actually a lot of people at Forest Hills at the time in my graduating class, maybe you were one of them who refused to sign the security oath. Yeah, And in I those remember. days, if you wouldn't sign it, you couldn't get your degree. So a lot of them went to Antioch and Oberlin, schools that didn't require people to have technically to have graduated from college. So. You know, I was not a red diaper baby, and you obviously were. So we had different um, experiences and backgrounds. Mm -hmm. uh, but. Uh, I'm wondering, it sounds like you were stigmatized a little bit by your parents' politics. Yeah, I mean, I felt uncomfortable about it. I, I knew that we, well, my parents believed in something that not, was not a popular thing. And unlike Norma, who had the camp, where she had a lot of friends, and she grew up in Newark and she had a lot of children that were friends that had grown up in similar families. I didn't have any of that until I started going to sort of progressive camps and left-wing camps. Which camps? I went to a camp named Wochika that was, uh, for years I thought it was an Indian camp and it turned out it stood for workers' children's camp. And first it was in uh, New Jersey and then it moved to Mount Tremper in New York outside of Woodstock and it's funny what's his name one of those guys who used to be on the left and then went all the way over to the right but I can't remember anybody's names who's that guy the guy was the editor of the uh, magazine one of those people yeah yeah, yeah. but I you know I, I never had the idea. I always felt like my parents believed in the right things. It was just that I also felt uncomfortable that I didn't necessarily want to be associated with it as a child. I mean, I was kind of a sensitive child to begin with, and you know, it was a little difficult for me. One one time, there was a big demonstration in Peekskill, New York, with Paul Ropes and and my father drove up there with our doctor and dentist, so we're both leftists, and the police in the town after the meeting 
uh, sat on people's cars so that people people in the town could stone them so my father's car came back with every window smashed in and you know I don't really remember what I thought but you know must have been I'm sure I felt a little traumatized you know what was it that my parents believed in that would result in that kind of reaction to them I'm um, sure they talked to me about it but I don't I don't really recall that did they send you to any kind of progressive uh, Jewish shula or Sunday school or anything like that? I think I went once or twice. The American Labor Party ran one. I mean, my parents at that point, I mean, ever had no real Jewish. I mean, we considered ourselves Jewish, but we weren't involved at all. No Passover, Jewish. no progressive uh, celebration yeah. of Passover. And it was true of my whole family. I mean, my mother's five sisters, people didn't practice Judaism. Yeah. Um, did, the thing that wasn't quite clear, when you went to Wisconsin, did, were you active in SDS? SDS wasn't really a big thing there. there were like, it was really big in Michigan where it was founded. It was, it was something, Students Against the War in Vietnam. And I, I went to meetings. I don't think, you know, I wasn't ever trying to be a leader or particularly pushing myself forward. I just was sort of a participant and things not. I, I think uh, I, I just wanted to add some of the detail. Uh, so that's the extent of my, I was going to ask you about Arthur Waskow, if he was th if he were there when he was there. I thought he was. He might have been, but he probably graduated before me. And Saul was there too, but I think he also, it was a whole group of people that were older than us who started studies on the left, which was, you know. Right a left-wing journal. I mean, Wisconsin always had a history, not now so much, of left-wing activism. It was kind of, for a long time, called, you know, the Berkeley of the Midwest. But unfortunately, I think, you know, a lot of that has died down there, as well as a lot of other colleges. Now. You know, I'm also trying to think of what apartment building, that was on Queens Boulevard? or No, it was on... Uh, 298 Saunders Street. It was like a block in from from uh, Marion Court. It was like, I think it was built in the early 40s. See, I just have this funny memory. I, I went to, I grew up in the projects, uh, so it would have been uh, uh, Pominac Housing. And whenever we, whenever we got off um, at the subway, yeah. um, it was clear that Jews were not Jews were just being allowed in to Forest Hills in terms of Well, we of actually rental. lived in Rigo Park. It was sort of like the poor yeah. side of the track. Yeah, for there us. There were still a lot of Italians and Irish. I don't know if you remember there were those little kind of bungalow houses. But I think the, that wasn't Jewish. And in my building, I think it was divided. I mean, my best, some of my best friends when I was a child were Catholic. These Catholic twins who had lived in my building, whose father worked for the fire department. He actually, sometime during that period, was sliding down the pole and hit his head and died. <laughs> that, uh, that's it. I just had some fill-in stuff. So. We are recording. Take it away. Okay. Uh, Roger, when did you uh, come to Washington, D.C., and why? And what was it like when you got here? It, I think it was May or June of 68. There were still machine guns on the Capitol steps. When were the riots in Washington? April. April. So it was soon thereafter. Yeah. And we were living at Second and C, right across where the Jefferson Library is. Yeah. And Norma was six months pregnant with Natasha, our older daughter, who's now 43. And as far as we know, we didn't know anybody here. Everything we had, Norma's father had given us a Volkswagen Bug as a wedding present. And we came down here with basically everything we had, which wasn't much. And I, I had gotten a job at uh, health Education and Welfare, the Children's Bureau, uh -huh. which had once been like a kind of leading progressive, you know, child welfare agency. But by the time I arrived in 68, it was filled with older women and its sort of passion had been lost. And I had a really boring job. But I got to know Mike and Madeline from, was it called Federal Employees for Democratic Society or something like that? I was never as active as the two of them. 
and I lasted about a year there. And the only fun time I had, other than their meetings, was helping to organize an anti-war demonstration among federal employees at, okay. before I left. We had Dr. Spock and Andy Jacobs, who was a Democratic liberal congressman from Indiana. It's hard to imagine that now, but and I don't remember who well spoke, but you know, it was sort of an inspiring thing. Was, Talk it, a little more about feds. The group that organized. You have to ask Mike about all that. Well, we'll ask you too, right? We'll ask several people about it, but uh, you organized within the national, the federal government. Yeah, we were in the union. I think we got thrown out of the union at one point. Were we in that? I think we were in AFSCME. And, right? Yeah. And we took a position against the war, and we got thrown out of there and joined AFGE. But it's not a part of my life that, you know, I was there a year. I don't really remember all that much of it. My job was boring, but we did, you know, Norma got active in the women's movement during that period. And I met people at the Institute. That's sort of what got me out of there. I don't know. Which institute was this? This institute, Can Institute for name? Policy Study. And I knew, what were the names? Sharon Devey and Marty, I can't remember his name, but Marty introduced me to Rob Burrell, and she was a fellow here who had been the founder of SDS at the University of Texas. Uh -huh. And mostly they were working on this project on Appalachia. So I quit my job for which I was being paid 9600 a big $9,600 at HEW and left to come work here. I think I was getting paid like $6,000 or something. Mm -hmm. But it was a lot more stimulating environment, but kind of, kind of, uh, Kind of intimidating too, you Why know. Is that? And with Mark and Dick and Arthur, everybody. We're talking. There about were the hardly any women. That we're talking were, about the Institute for Policy yeah. Studies mm -hmm. here. Um, and I spent a lot of time with Rob and Marty and and another guy, Rick, named Rick Simon, who was a professor at American University, and mm -hmm. some people who worked in Morgantown, West Virginia. And we had this project called People's Appalachian Research Collective. And we spent time in Morgantown. There was a whole group of people uh, working there, doing stuff with welfare rights and helping miners for democracy. Arnold Miller, who was running against, I forgot who it was, who was the head of the Mine Workers Union in those days. But there was a whole insurgency, you know, in, in that union, in the Teamsters Union, to get rid of, you know, the union leaders who weren't taking very good care of the members of their union. And a lot of people we met actually once the insurgents, one went to work for the new guy who, but we were sort of in a different wing. And, uh, there were about five or six of us, one woman who worked at the Department of Energy and the rest of us were all men. And we went, I mean, sometimes I wondered exactly what I was up to. I mean, I had very little history or knowledge, although I got to, you know, learn a lot about Appalachia and I wrote some things and, well, your social you know, work in an exciting time. Yeah, my social work your, background. Your social work background must have led you to some of that, right? And just, you know, feeling much more stimulated than I did in my job in the federal government just didn't seem interesting at all. And, you know, through here, although I don't remember a lot of the details, every progressive person from around the country would come here and speak and you know Norma was getting involved with the women's movement and started off our backs in the basement of our house one of the first feminist newspapers in the United States uh, and we went we went to lots of demonstrations but again I never tried to be a leader of any of those things I just participated in them so I mean my main work was working at the Institute and in uh, with this organization in Appalachia. So. Well, this would have been in the late 60s, early 70s in Washington, D.C., and one of yeah. my memories is that we put up hundreds of people over the course of every year when these big demonstrations came through. Mm -hmm. Being in Washington, D.C. Yeah. meant that you were sort of invaded by a peaceful army of people for the most part, but right. you were right at the center of things. 
I'm really, sorry, what? You were right at the yeah, center of things. Right. You maybe you didn't consider yourself a leader, but mm, you were at the center right. of things, and there's a lot of information yeah. flowing around. Yeah, I remember on May Day, uh, what's her name, the one woman who's the head of 9 to 5 now, Ellen. Karen Nussbaum. No, no. No, oh, Ellen. Ellen Bravo. Ellen Bravo came, brought, I think she was teaching at St. Mary's College, and brought like 30 kids to, to stay at our house. And we were going to go out and demonstrate, but Natasha, who was a little girl, then got, I mean, there were so many people around, she got all upset. And so I stayed home, and later we went to, I think, Rob and other people who went out in the street. They got arrested in very quick time. And actually, I'd worked with uh, Jim True and other people to put out this newsletter, because I had mixed emotions about blocking all the traffic. I mean, I never ended Maybe. up doing it and stopping people from being able to get to work. And we put out this thing, I think it was called People in the Streets, about you know trying to explain to people why people were doing that, what was going on that, you know, that seemed to require us to sort of raise the level of activity. So. Mm. Were you arrested during May Day? No, I've never been arrested. How about Norma? No. Is Norma was Norma arrested no, during No, Norma was never arrested either. There were thousands of people arrested during yeah. the day. I remember they took them all to Kennedy Stadium, thousands of people, including a lot of people who weren't part of the demonstration, mm -hmm. who were rounded up. And I f remember going to get Rob. I don't know how long he was there for, because we, we were living with him and Janet Simon yeah. in those days mm -hmm. in our house in, in mm -hmm. uh, Adams Morgan. So. Um, how did you deal with, in, in the work that you did, you said that you didn't feel that you were a leader, but you were always a worker in some way. Mm -hmm. um, how did you deal with the failures or, or even the successes of your work? Did you, did, you, did you feel at the time you were doing something very important and what happened was very important, or would you just kind of take it into stride? No, but I found like there was a great excitement to it. And, uh, you know, I remember feeling like, you know, like revolution was going to happen. That that's moments, I'm not sure that would have been such a great thing in hindsight, but that something transformative was about to happen, you know. That so many people were involved in so many places. And, you know, it was sort of like a life, I mean, you know, Norma was heavily involved in the newspaper, and you know, even though I felt a little alienated at the institute, it's amazing that it lasted for ten years, I think, because I felt a little intimidated. They'd have those meetings, and you know, the people who founded this place and would sort of sit around these big tables, and the rest of us would sit, you know, in the back row and sort of admire what they said or not admire it, and. I was sort of in the more activist wing. I mean, Rob and I and people like Jim Weeks, it was a whole lot of younger people. Jeremy Brecker and Con Hickey, where he later ran his congressional campaign in Illinois. But I think they felt it was sort of over-intellectualized what we were doing here and that people needed to do more active work out in the world and sort of to some degree, our work in Appalachia kind of reflected that, our feeling that we really t needed to be, you know, more engaged with people than just writing books or or talking about doing things, but to actually be doing things. So. Can you recreate what one of those meetings felt like? Um, can you at the Institute for Policy Studies in the late sixties? Can you name names? <laughs> well. Later, I don't know how this, you know, they were going to do this encyclopedia. I think it was Mark's idea, or maybe it was Mark and Dick. Mm -hmm. And I was supposed to do a whole thing on regionalism. I mean, Rob kind of protected me, maybe too much. I think that's why I lasted too much, because I don't think, I'm not even sure I knew always what I was doing, but, you know, he and I were close to each other, and he felt good about me. I'm not sure. I had the same kind of feeling that I got from other people. You know, I was much, even in that period, I was much more shy than I later became. 
And even though I often thought that things weren't exactly being done right here, I, I don't think I was very outspoken about that. Maybe I was would talk to Rob about it, but you know, I didn't have the courage or whatever to say, you know, be forthcoming in my own right about things that I felt could be done better. Such as? Well, first of all, that in the way it worked, I think, I don't think they really involved, you know, those of us who weren't fellows in the full operation of the place. I don't think they took full use of those of us who worked here, you know, it was sort of kind of an elite operation. And although it was real interesting and all the conferences that they had, but I think for people who were fellows and for women as well, I mean, there were women that were eventually made, you know, Tina Smith kind of administratively ran the place and Cynthia Washington was here and eventually, uh, what's her name? This escapes me. But women were sort of pushed, you know, weren't ever considered at the forefront of the place in that period. Scott, all right, we're good. On the Appalachian project, any contact with Alan Margaret McShirley? Oh yeah, were... yeah, we worked with him some. I don't remember the details. I knew both of them, you know, and I don't remember what exactly we engaged. But you know, we were worked with them on some things without remembering the specifics. Before the lawsuit, about. before the Supreme Court. Yeah, before that. Um, you know, there were lots of splits on the left. Uh, Marks Rim One, Rim Two, the Maoists, the impact of the Black Panther Party. Did any of that impact you? Well, it frustrated me. I mean, I never was part of anything. I tell you, I had friends who were, you know, Maoists in uh, Revolutionary Union and in the October League, and I went to two of the three Black Panther conventions: the one that was here and the one in Philadelphia. And I think I always felt slightly frustrated that we were spending so much time dividing among us and we were working together. And I never quite understood that. I think naive is not the exact word. Idealistic, I guess. I always had a sense of idealism that if we really were gonna work together to change things, then it wasn't gonna happen if we kept splitting off from each other. But you know, I never wrote anything about that. Probably was, you know, private conversations about it. I was also in, it was a Marxist, Leninist, Mao Zedong study group that I was part of. I don't know how long that went on with Phil Wolfson and Alice Wolfson and Lee and Marilyn Webb and I don't remember. Was Kathy Wilkerson in that? Huh? Was Kathy Wilkerson in that group? No. No, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I never really knew her. Did, did you consider yourself, um, were you a true believer when it came to the concept of a revolution? Did you believe a revolution was going to happen uh, late 60s, early 70s, mid 70s? Was that a reality to you? Ever? Probably. I think in some funny way, because I had a child already and then later too, I always kept one foot in the working world. And Norma did too. I sort of never was ready to give up my whole life, you know, to fight for revolution. And maybe it was because of my upbringing or what my fear about my upbringing that I always felt like I had, you know, I didn't want to go to jail. I didn't want to totally surrender everything, you know, I didn't want to throw myself totally into things without, you know, having responsibility for my ch child and then my children. So, and there must have been some cautiousness based on what I saw that I wasn't ever sure that people could really pull off a kind of real, whether you want to call it revolution, transformation, you know. People engaged after a while in such craziness that 
whether it was blowing things up. I think probably at one point I fantasized being involved in that, but you know, I never really wanted to hurt anybody. I mean, I never wanted to see anybody get killed. You know, and I think I kept my some of my social work mentality in that. You know, I was always interested in. People getting individual help, whether it was therapeutic. I was in therapy myself because, you know, since the time I was a little kid, I suffered from bouts of depression, and I could never figure out how much of that was the world and how much of it was genetics and how much of it was biology. So it stopped me at certain points in my life. You know, prevented me from being as involved in things sometimes. Or, or That's the one the risks your parents were taking all the time. Yeah, that too. And, you know, I, I guess I didn't say that. I mean, I'm not sure I really felt that way, but that what happened to the Rosenbergs could happen to my parents. And, you know. And you know, uh, I remember the women's, I guess it was a collective, uh, Marilyn Webb and um, uh, Wolfson and um, your, your wife. Mm -hmm. And they were a very moderate group. They were all very nice, attractive. Uh, they were hardly threatening. But at the same time, you had things like the Scum Manifesto, uh, Society for Cutting Up Men. Uh, and you had other uh, pretty violent anti, I mean, my memory of that whole period is women walking out of meetings and getting up and denouncing men. So I'm just curious, did that have any, and men, uh, being denounced by their wives, you know, and breaks up a break up of a lot of marriages. No, I was in Did a any... group with with Jim Weeks when you know Charlotte left him, and the, with uh, Phil Wolfson. And Lee might have been in there too. I don't remember who else was in there, but a lot of the uh, Marty Wolfson, whose wife left him for a woman, and you know, a lot of them would sort of be so self-critical. I mean, the man. You know, that they didn't deserve these women, that the women would be better off. I never had that feeling particularly. I mean, I don't think I was totally dependent on Norma or she on me, but I, I think we were interdependent. And, you know, I didn't want to live a life of either being a full time revolutionary or a man without a family. You know, I enjoyed that part of my life to, you know, have children and to be involved with other people who were children. But since off our backs was in the basement of our house and gradually there were more and more gay women who came to work there. And I think, I don't know, eventually there was some kind of split in the newspaper, you know. And there were sort of splits even while everybody was, when Marilyn was still working there in Norma, Bobby Spalter Roth and, you know, I'm not sure I really enjoyed a feminist newspaper being in the basement of a house at that point, you know. It felt like it was a little imposition. And then Norma got involved with Saul Landau and the film group, and you know, so there was a lot of things going on, even within our own family. So it was in some ways amazing that we survived together, you know, during that period. So I think the strength of having come from the same kind of family. I mean, we're both sets of parents and that we had known each other for such a long time and that we really understood each other, the kind of families we had come from, you know, was a great strength that kept us together when, you know, lots of couples were falling apart. I, I am curious about one thing, just because I have an old, my own personal interest in it, and that is, uh, it's unusual, I mean, you both, both of you married people who were Jewish, pure non-spiritual, non-religious background. Um, did you expose your kids to any, um, beyond social justice, any celebrations of holidays, festivals, anything to make them aware of, um, of the fact that you were both Jewish and somewhat different yeah. in that aspect? And what happened to them? Did they go yeah. on to mm -hmm. marry straight people, Jews? Um, uh, well, we've been having a Seder with other families for 25 years, but it was very, you know, uh, 
non not non traditional, but it wasn't very religious, basically, you know. And your kids grew up with that. The kids were involved in that, yeah. But I don't. They, they didn't. I mean, now my older daughter sometimes comes to our house and sometimes goes to David's parents, her husband, but his parents too were never been particularly religious. So. But Jewish. Yeah. Jewish. Boy, that's a study by itself. And she was exactly. married by a rabbi. And, they and you didn't rabbi. object? No, I wanted them to. I wanted to, you know, the choice of having some non-religious, totally unreligious thing. And he was the rabbi uh, Hillel at Rutgers University because Norma grew up in New Brunswick where Rutgers is. Uh, and mean, my parents had, I mean, my mother eventually she went to a independent ashram in India, so she had her own kind of spiritual awakening, which affected me. I mean, she wasn't there for long, but I was totally irreligious when I was young. I mean, I called myself an atheist. I don't think of myself in those terms anymore. And I got it, never particularly in Judaism, actually, but in Hinduism and Buddhism, you know, there are lots of Jews I've met at those things who, for whatever reason, instead of practicing Judaism, are involved with Hinduism or Buddhism, which is strange in a way. I mean, I don't know why that is. Well, just the irony of here, three generations of secular Jews who happen to find each other for reasons based on something, but not spirituality, I don't think. It is interesting. And my father, you know, I don't know, get into this this much, eventually after the union and was out of work in his 40s and, you know, loading, ra loading freight and railroad cars and teaching people how to drive and working at Sam Goody in the record store, you know, and somehow it was strange. He sent, there was a blind ad in the New York Times and it turned out to be for the United Jewish Appeal. So here in our family who had absolutely no real Jewish experience. Turns out my great grandfather, because in Sweden, my uncle who I just visited has done a whole uh, genealogy. And my great grandfather was a rabbi actually. Yeah, everyone's, <laughs> everyone was. <laughs> so That is fascinating. You know. So, but anyway, so my father spent the last 25 years of his life you know, as an executive with the United Jewish Appeal and knew all the heads of Israel. I mean, he's known Yale Dayan since he was 17. You know, he knew Paris and Rabin and Begin. And I have a book at home that I just got from my mother because I was afraid she'd throw it all away of letters that people wrote to her when my father died about what a great guy he was and how great he had been for Israel. And, he was honored by the Knesset when he retired. As a and he was an anti-Zionist. I don't know if he was anti-Zionist. He was critical of things about Israel. I think you know their anti-Arab stuff. I guess. But one of his best friends was uh, Ehud Olmert. He was the only one who spoke at his service besides me. Did you come to the first or second Freedom Seder? We, yeah. You did. Mm -hmm. First one at Lincoln Temple? Yeah, I think I was at that one. Yeah. And, and the striking Maoist sanitation workers, the second one? I don't think American I was at University. that. No. Yeah, any memory of that Freedom Seder? I this just remember Arthur and, you know, sort Channing of vague Phillips. images, but not really, no. Okay, I'll probably stop there then. Go. Let's talk about raising your kids in Washington, D.C. What was it like to be a D.C. kid with a D.C. parent? Well, we had, you know, we had a big support group. I mean, when yes, I from the that 80s, we had that daycare center on Wisconsin Avenue. And before that, we sent Tasha to Harvard Street School. Harvard and, Street School. You know, there were lots of friends that were involved with that. And we had, Free you know, babysitting co-ops. And, you know, we were all involved with each other and raising, helping raise each other's children. That's right. Our kids actually had a pretty strong collective. The kids that were born in the late 60s and the early 70s, there was a lot of them, and they seemed to have a pretty collective sort of experience because their parents were involved with each other. 
on a professional level right. as well as a personal level, and the kids tended mm -hmm. to go to the same schools. But it's funny because we decided after Tasha did a few years of public school, you know, we didn't, I don't know how we managed this because we didn't have much money, but we sent Tasha and later Megan to Georgetown Day. You know, I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy in school myself when I was a child. I, I needed, I wanted my parents to send me. I believe it was out of the question or they weren't even aware of it. There were schools like the Riddle, Little Red Schoolhouse that other children that grew up in similar families but came from families with more money sent their kids to. I just never felt like I got the attention I needed at school and I didn't feel like I was getting it at home either. And, mm. you know, so I think Barbara Bick was friends with the admissions director at Georgetown Day. And Georgetown Day had a whole tradition of, you know, it started because of to be one of the first integrated schools in Washington. So there were a lot of liberal type parents, and uh, but most of them eventually had more and more money. So, but Tasha got a really good education there. She made lots of good friends. She was really happy there. You know, I think we always had friends, whether it was moving to Bethesda or from Adams Morgan and not to like Tacoma Park or sending our kids to private school instead of public school. It was always, I think, the feeling I got or, you know, that people said something to us about that we weren't necessarily being consistent with our values. But again, it was keeping a foot in each world. You know, I didn't feel like I ever betrayed my values in terms of how I live my life and you know I felt like I was trying to do the best thing that my children would be happy in this world given that it was such a difficult world that they would feel you know a greater sense of self-confidence that I felt at that age you know that didn't come for me until I was late into my 30s, I think, that I started feeling much more confident in life, so. What do you think are the most important things that you've done that you're proud of to pass on? Well, I mean, in a strange way, even though I felt uncomfortable often in my family, you know, I think my parents gave me this incredible sense of caring about not only the world in a, a big sense, but in individual people. And, you know, the arc of my life, it sort of went back and forth between trying to do political work and going back into social work. And the last 10 years, although I wasn't particularly happy with where I worked, I spent working for the child welfare agency in the district. Uh, taking care of kids who had been abused and getting abused kids adopted and trying to help their crack addicted mothers even though sometimes it felt like they were beyond help but I had a real ability to to relate to them and you know to show them that I really cared about them I mean I could see it in their eyes so so even though I felt in my agency, I mean, I was one of the few white men and I was older than most of the social workers, it was kind of, I felt like it was valuable work. Mm -hmm. And when I, I went to, uh, I got this job after the Institute, it was so ironic, I got a job in the Justice Department with this new program giving money to community-based organizations around mm -hmm. the country. And, we actually, I'm not even sure he remembers, Richard Levy, Phil's brother, was on the board of the Big Apple Circus. So we had this Irish guy and I, he was my boss, it was the two of us with $30 million to give away. So we tried to give it to as many as we could find, the progressive organizations who were doing crime prevention with the most bigger sense of being community organizers, not just sort of narrow stuff. And the way I ended up in Cleveland working for Kucinich is I gave money to a group out there that uh, 
Karen was involved and Karen Nussbaum and Ira Orlick. He wasn't working for Kucinich, but he was the head of the Ohio Public Interest yeah. Campaign. O Opic. And Jack Nickel, I don't know if you ever knew him, Carol. Yeah, Curse. Yeah. yeah. So I got, I went out there because I was the grant monitor and I met all those people. And uh, what year, what year that was in. 70, when was Kucinich? 76. May, 77, yeah, about 76. Something like that. And I came back and I told Norm I wanted to move to Cleveland to work for Kucinich. And, you know, what did she think about that? Because it wasn't clear he was going to be reelected. Of course, he wasn't. I mean, it was his first term and he never, he didn't win the second term. Mm -hmm. And so Norm stayed here for six months while I got a job as the Associate Commissioner of Human Resources. I worked for Jack Nickel. Actually, I lived with him, so. And of course, he didn't win, and I came back home, but it was, you know, it was sort of exciting to be part of that. I used to get, it was like, they had all these 20-something year olds who Kucinich had put in charge of these agencies. So I was like an old man, I was 36, and I used to get, written up in the Cleveland Plain Dealer all the time as an outside agitator because <laughs> I had come from Washington and nobody could figure out how I was coming out of the Justice Department to work for Kucinich in Cleveland. And when he lost, I had another friend that I had met from here, Con Hickey, who was like a youth person here who was running for Congress for John Anderson's seat the year John Anderson ran for president from Rockford, Illinois. And mm -hmm. So Khan hired me sort of to uh, run his campaign. <laughs> I mean, we didn't have a prayer, but his mother had been one of the first women state senators in Rockford, so, I mean, in the state legislature, so, so it was a good experience. And then finally, after about nine months, I mean, I come home on the weekend sometime. I came back and, you know, got involved in other work. It's been a rather checkered career, but it's, it was a lot better. I mean, Noma spent 35 years working for the same federal agency. I never could have done that. Last question here. I'm going to ask you, do you, which, if any, groups or organizations, uh, in, your, in your opinion, um, sort of carried the torch forward after the 60s and the 70s uh, in really any field that you worked in. Um, lots of those organizations, most of them collapsed and some of them didn't leave much of a legacy, but some of them I think did. Do you have any thoughts about that or what has lasted that you see as valuable from some of those organizations? I guess I go you know, up and down when Organize started. I thought, well, maybe this is the rise of something new. Mm -hmm. But I must say, you know, I have lots of friends, and I'm involved in lots of different things, although none of them are very political, they're more personal in a way. And I really, I, I wonder, I think one of the mistakes, I don't think, I think in order to, this is the spiritual people that I've been involved with in my life, I've always had discussions with them about why they're not more active out in the world, and. You know, they think that by changing themselves, then the world will change. And that's true, in a way. And the political people often are totally engaged in politics and not taking care of themselves at all, and either burn themselves out or become very cynical or stop doing the work totally. And I think there needs to be kind of a new fusion of those two things. But how that's going to happen, I really don't see on the drawing board right now. I mean, my mother, when I was a little kid, told me, you know, that by the time I grew up, you know, it would be a much better world. And I guess in some ways it is, yeah. but in many ways it isn't. it's a worse world. And, uh, you know, and I'm getting old. And, you know, I just wonder where and how those big changes are going to be made, if they're ever going to be made. So. But I have a happy life. That's nice. Good. That's a good finish. But they've never really been involved much in any kind of politics. Yeah. Do you, um, are you or your wife involved in any kind of activism today? 
you know, giving money sometimes to things, but nothing beyond that. Lessons of the 60s. Huh? Lessons of the 60s. Um, yeah, I mean, just, this group, you know, I don't know that this is exactly activism, but it's, you know, sure, it tries been. to carry on some, you know, what we yeah. learned or tried yeah. to learn or so somebody will remember it and our struggles to, you know, to bring the world to a better place. Uh, there was an incident with you and the family next door when you were living. Was it Mount Pleasant or Adams Harkin? You mean with Henry and Lucy? Or yeah. An yeah. Answer? There was an incident where a community organizer was killed practically at your doorstep. And no, there was a teacher killed at our doorstep. Oh. He lived next door. There was a. What year was that? Again? Must have been the early 70s. Yeah. And it was strange because uh, Georgetown Day had this exchange program. I don't know, it was a little crazy with these kids from Hawaii. <laughs> and so this young girl who was about Megan's age, maybe she was 11, and she was staying there and about 3 in the morning. Uh, I heard the guy from next door come home and uh, he was walking up the steps and somebody said, give me your money and I forgot if he said he didn't have any and, you know, he killed him. So. And you and the Schoenfelds moved sometime No, it wasn't no. related to that. It wasn't? No. No. I actually was involved too with I was on the board of the Latin American Youth Center, and when uh, that person was killed by a policeman in that little park on Harvard Street, I organized this thing with Frank Smith and, and Lori Kaplan and her husband, who was Salvadorian, and churches and stuff, and to try to get everybody to work together to improve the neighborhood, to because I was actually. Besides being a social worker, I spent 25 years, you know, as a mediator, mostly as a divorcee. Okay. So, um, Were you affected at all by the tensions between blacks and whites at all during that? Because uh, you didn't, uh, you only made a little bit of a reference to it, but to the split that I, I remember pretty vividly uh, affect either of you very much. I'm, I'm sorry, say that again. You know, there's late 60s uh, as, as the black liberation mm -hmm. struggle right. affected mm -hmm. everything, civil right. rights groups. Right. Um, and uh, did that impact either of you? No, not that I felt particularly. Uh, I guess the, the final question is IPS to me. Um, because I remember teaching a couple of courses here, but nowhere near as involved as you were, always uh, came across as uh, uh, somewhat, I mean, it was a think tank, and it was a bit of a sanctuary. Uh, if there were riots across the street, yeah, you, you could, could get in, there, you right. could duck in the IPS. <laughs> so it was a little bit of a sanctuary, think tank, support, uh, rather than vanguard of any proposed revolution. Uh, and, and also a place for left revolutionaries, uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, thinkers, historians, writers right. to be. Um, uh, but not necessarily, kind of more of a support mechanism mm -hmm. for people on the left rather than that much of an inspiration right. for, for um, things on the left. Is that your recollection or is that just yeah I mean I think although you know like Mark spent a lot of time early on with the Adams school I think I think we got some stuff from Marsher about his activism and that but I don't recall really I think our project was unusual the one in Appalachia where people really went out of this place into the world to try to do things that were different. I mean, I wouldn't have called that stuff revolutionary. I mean, in a way, it merged my background as a community organizer with dealing with people who were, you know, have always been historically exploited. I mean, it never has changed, really, so. That's, uh, <laughs> that's 